Welcome to ISAP, the International Forum for Sustainable Asia and the Pacific 2021, organized by IGES, the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. We are pleased to start liberalizing microplastics pollution in ASEAN countries. Current state of knowledge. I'm Yukako Inamura, policy researcher at IGES, and I will moderate the session. Today, I am joined by Dr. Emily Storadi from French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, Dr. Chris Laff from University of Michigan, Dr. Amanda Simbling, Head of Environmental Engineering Graduate Postgraduate Study at Institute Technology Bandung, Ms. Janet Salem, Economic Affairs Officer at United Nations Economic and Social Commissions for Asia and the Pacific. Just, Mr. Justin Wiganda, Vice Chairman of Indonesian Plastic Recycling Association. Dr. Amira Abenayaka, Policy Researcher at IGES. And Dr. Pham Gok Bao, Deputy Director at IGES. Thank you all for giving us some of your time the session will be 80 minutes long, and I hope you will enjoy and actively participate. Water pollution caused by microplastics generated from land-based sources is recognized as an emerging environmental problem in many countries. Today, we focus on the issue in ASEAN countries. We asked Dr. Storadi Dr. Pham, Dr. Sembling, and Dr. Laff to share their research and asked Ms. Salem, Dr. Abenayaka, and Mr. Wiganda to discuss the problem, to find solutions bridging between science, business, and policy. Now, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Storadi. She gives a keynote speech on liberal microplastics pollution, general knowledge. Dr. Storadi plans to attend the session from Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam today. However, unfortunately, due to the internet problems, she is not with us. If you have any questions to her, please send it to us via the Q&A box. We will send questions to her after the session. Please do not forget to write your email address to receive her response. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Stradi. I'm a researcher at French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development. I'm from the laboratory MIO in France. And since 2015, I'm based in Vietnam at the Ho Chi Minh University of Technology where I'm conducting research on uh, riverine microplastic pollution. So today I'm very honored to be invited to give a keynote speech at ISAP 2021 in this session on riverine microplastics. And so I would like to take this opportunity to give you some uh, general knowledge on this, but also to try to, con to convince you why it's very important to um, better understand this pollution and why it's very important to tackle it, especially in the rivers. So I would like to begin first by defining what are microplastics. So microplastics are pieces of plastics which have a size comprised between one micrometer and five millimeters. So it can be any kind of polymer of plastics. There is no restriction regarding uh, the um, nature of plastics and the polymers. So when we talk about microplastics, most of the time we define them by the shapes. And the shapes is how we observe them at the stereo microscope or the microscopes. So there is different categories of shapes. There is the films, the sheets, the lines of fibers, the fragments, the pellet of the forms. So what are the sources of microplastics? 
So we um, have the primary microplastics that are the plastic which are coming from directly from the industry. So like the plastic pellets that are produced to be molded and then produce uh, other plastic items. So in that case, they are directly released by the industry during the production phase. And there are also in these primary microplastics, all the microbits uh, included into the personal care products. So these small um, microbits uh, that are put it in toothpaste or exfoliant or creams and so on. There are also the secondary microplastics. So these microplastics originate from the mechanical and chemical degradation of larger plastic items. And it's uh, mainly what uh, abrasion of uh, UV degradation of larger plastic items. In that case, there are different sources of microplastics to the environment. There are the degradation of the daily use plastics. So not only the single use plastics, but all the plastic that we are using every day um, in our life. There are the sources from the agriculture sectors. So there are a lot of plastics that are used in agriculture, especially to uh, uh, produce the vegetables and the fruits. So I'm thinking about the plastic mulch that it puts uh, on the soil, but also all the cages, the trays, and the packaging that are used uh, to produce those vegetables and those fruits. When they degrade, um, the microplastics are released directly in the soil or uh, in the surrounding environment. A major source of um, microplastics is also the textile and garment industry, which is using a lot of fibers of synthetic origins. So mainly uh, the polyester is one of the most used one. And when uh, the textile and garment are produced from the fibers during the production phase, there is some mechanical uh, degradation and then some uh, microfibers are released in the environment. This textile, when we wash them uh, every day in our daily life, and when we wash our clothes in, in, your, in our washing machine, we know that a washing machine is uh, degrading the textile and producing microfibers, so plastics, um, that are then released into the wet water. One source of microplastics uh, is also transportation and specifically the abrasion of tire. So this source is quite underestimated because it's very difficult, very tricky to observe those uh, plastic items, those microplastic under a stereo microscope or microscope. So most of the times it is not included in the study. We have also uh, the landfills, which can produce uh, microplastics. So this is when the large items of uh, plastic which have been wasted are uh, degraded mechanically or are in decomposition state, then um, those microplastic is released to the surrounding environment. And finally, uh, the fishery and aquaculture sector is a key sector that are producing uh, microplastic, especially in estuaries and coastal zones. So it's mainly originated from the nets that are used, but also from the cages, uh, the lines, the hang line, the boys, uh, all this uh, equipment that stay a couple of years in the water and then degrade uh, very quickly. So now what, that we know the sources of those microplastics, how do they arrive in the rivers? So they have, um, there is four pathways that have been identified. And um, of course, what we think of is the in-situ degradation. So it's when these primary or secondary microplastics are in the water and continue to degrade in the environment. We know also that um, atmospheric fallout, dry or wet, can deposit microplastics. So these microplastics originate from different uh, industry or use and can, via the atmospheric fallout, be deposited directly in the rivers. This, they can also be deposited on the roads, on the soils, on the roof. And in that case, sorry, they will arrive in the river via the surface runoff. 
So the precipitation is bringing also all this uh, microplastic that has been deposited by atmospheric fallout, but also all the microplastic which is released in the world, in the soil, or uh, elsewhere. Finally, the last pathways are the waste waters. So the waste waters in the Asian country are not uh, um, often treated. Most of them are not treated. So if they are, even if they are treated, they are releasing uh, microplastic in their effluent. So we have to take into account that when the wastewater treatment plant were developed, were conceived, they were not conceived to remove microplastic. So it's mean that even if there is a treatment, uh, their efficiency to remove the microplastic is more or less efficient, meaning that the wastewater treated or not treated will always release a microplastic to this to its effluent and then to the river. So knowing what are microplastics, where are they from, how do they, how are they transferred to the river? Why shall we care of their presence in our rivers? At first, uh, we have to keep in mind that microplastic are carriers of organic and inorganic contaminants. So plastics, it's uh, polymers to which uh, additives are added. These additives are chemicals, uh, contaminant like organic or inorganic one, which giving them the uh, specific properties. They also um, have the ability, this microplastic in the water, to sorb the other contaminants that are in the water. So at the end, those microplastics are a cocktail of contaminants, a complex mixture that can have a toxical toxicity uh, to the environment afterwards. Also, microplastic are carriers of pathogens and antibiotic uh, resistant genes. So several studies uh, in marine waters, but also fresh water, have shown that uh, bacteria, pathogens, and antibiotic resistant genes are developing selectively on biofilm that is developing itself of microplastic. So we have typical bacterial pathogens and antibiotic resistant genes developing on the surface of microplastics. And this is important to keep in mind knowing that microplastics are carried from the rivers to the ocean. Then, uh, as you all know, microplastic can be ingested by aquatic biota. They can be ingested by the smallest organisms, the zooplankton, as you can see in this uh, fluorescence microscopy image, where the microplastic can be ingested, ingested, or adhered to the zooplankton. They can also be ingested by a bigger organism like fishes or seabirds. And because they are carrying contaminants and also pathogens, they can induce toxicological effects. So here are the figures of the toxicological effects observed on fishes, but it's also on every kind of organisms, where we can see that the effects can be on the organ level, at the cell level, and also at the subcellular level. So it's important also to keep in mind that regarding the toxicological effects, it's not systematic on every species. It's really depending on the species that we are uh, the researcher are studying, but also on the kind of plastic they are studying, the kind of polymers and then the additive on these polymers, and also all the parameters surrounding on, uh, surrounding on the environment. So it's very, it's not easy and it still needs understanding on how uh, macroplastic can induce toxicological effects or not on the organisms. Finally, we know that microplastics are carrying all those things and uh, can be uh, very bad effects to the environment and to the biota. They are transferred from the river to the coastal zone. But we have very few ideas on the transition time, how long they stay in the water. In fact, uh, the microplastic can float in the river, they can settle, 
they can be deposited on the bottom, they can be trapped, and they can be uh, resuspended with the velocity of the current. So those uh, settling capacity do not depend on the density. It's not because your uh, plastic is light that is floating, and it's not because your plastic is dense that it's deposited at the bottom of the, your sediments. So it's also depending on the size of the plastic, on its shapes, and also on its ability to aggregate with organic matter, or the sediments, the formation of biofilm, and so on, and also on the uh, current velocity, friction in the water column, and so on. So it's um, very difficult to uh, apprehend and to know how long it takes for a plastic that has been emitted in the river to go to the coastal zone and then to the ocean. So still a lot to learn about that. So why riverine microplastic an environmental issue in ASEAN, specifically in ASEAN? So this um, area of the world have important sources of microplastics. First of all, it has uh, more than 650 million inhabitants, so meaning a lot of plastic, uh, daily plastic use, single-use plastic, a lot of laundries, a lot of transportation, and so on. There is also um, a key economic sectors, which is agriculture and fisheries. So a lot of nets, a lot of boys, a lot of cajun and hong line are used in the water, uh, in the delta, in the lagoons, in the estuaries of these areas. We have also to keep in mind that in this part of the world, there is an important part of global exports of clothing and a lot of industry producing textile and garments, so emitting plastics to the environment, and especially fibers. And also, uh, this part of the world have been, um, uh, have been shown as an important waste mismanagement area. So we know that the sources are quite important, but also that the pathways of microplastic to the environment are quite specific. There is a tropical mountain climate, with an uh, important or absence of atmospheric fallout, we can perturbate on the pathways of microplastic to, to the rivers, and also this intense surface runoff when we are in the period of monsoon. And there is also an insufficient wastewater treatment plant capacity in this area. So because of these important sources and these specific pathways, the riverine microplastic is a very key environmental issue, and we really need to understand it specifically in this area. As you can see in these figures, this is a review of the number of study on microplastic in freshwater ecosystem of Asia. And as you can see, it's, there is very few, uh, few papers compared to the other uh, part of the world, it's very few in Asia. And specifically, if we look at the ASEAN, it's very few too. Some countries, we, we have like one or two uh, data published on it. So um, what we can say is that the, in the ASEAN, there is very few data available on the uh, abundance of the riverine uh, microplastic pollution. And if we have few data, we have a poor understanding of the abundance of the sources of those microplastics, where are they from, of their transfer to uh, finally the river and then the coastal zone, and on the impact on the, the organisms, but also economical impacts on also uh, on the human health and so on. So it's uh, very difficult when you have few data and poor understanding to develop adapted policy to tackle the pollution. So here, I really would like to emphasize that it's very important to achieve data, to achieve knowledge, to really understand the fate of microplastic in the ASEAN country, because it's very specific. And if we understand well the sources, their transfer, and the impact um, on, on, on the inhabitants, but also on the economy on different sectors, it will be, I would say, easier to develop adapted policy to tackle the pollution. So we really need to keep a dialogue between the scientists producing the data, producing this knowledge, and the policymakers that are 
taking this knowledge to transform it into uh, to transform it sorry into policies. So um, I hope that this keynote will be helpful for you uh, for the next speech, and I really hope um, that we will learn more about the uh, uh, status of microplastic pollution in Philippines and Vietnam. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm here for more questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Storadi, for the keynote speech and presenting the basic point of microplastic issues. I now would like to invite second speaker, Dr. Pham. Dr. Pham, floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Inamura. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fang Mok Bao uh, from the East Steel for Global Environmental Strategy. So it is my great pleasure today to have a chance to share with you our ongoing work in ASEAN country to address the emerging issue, issue of river microplastic from salt to river. So before my talk, I'd like to thank uh, all our uh, partners in ASEAN who uh, contribute uh, uh, a very, who give us a very fruitful contribution and cooperation in the ongoing works, uh, namely uh, our partner AMH from Philippines, uh, IRD uh, from French, and uh, Ho Chi Minh University uh, of Science and Technology. So this is a very brief outline of my talk today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to share with you some very brief background on the plastic inventions and how it's developed in Asia as well as in ASEAN region and the plastic production and it leakage to the environment. And also we discussed about the plastic occurrence, ingestions and impacts in the ASEAN country with some kind of potential impact on the ecosystem and human health. And also how to address, how to remove the microplastic uh, from uh, water and wastewater treatment plant and also how to address this challenge through the circular plastic economy approach and so on. So uh, some of you may know that uh, the first uh, and fully synthetic uh, plastic were first invented in early 1900s and making it the beginning of the global plastic industry. However, the rapid growth in, uh, in uh, plastic productions uh, has not been relied until 1950s. So uh, during uh, 1950 until 2000s, the annual plastic uh, productions increased quite rapidly uh, from 200 uh, million uh, tons and uh, to more than uh, uh, 300 uh, million tons. And it's estimated that more than 70% of the plastic were produced just after 1990. And uh, like other materials, uh, it can may have any potential impact on, in, on the environment if, it, if it's not properly managed. So similarly, uh, plastic is also a very unique material which bring a lot of benefit and convenience to our society nowadays. Uh, nobody can deny. However, due to the mismanagement, we are turning the plastic into an emerging challenge or emerging pollutant to our environment and to our world. As a result, it's now having a lot of impact to the ecosystem and uh, human health. Especially in uh, the developed uh, country are generating more uh, plastic waste per capita than developing country. And also uh, on the other hand, due to the mismanaged plastic uh, in, in, uh, uh, in developing country, it creates a lot of problem especially in the Asian region. So I can, I, I can show you here in the figure, uh, more than 70% uh, of plastic were produced after 1990. And uh, ASEAN country contribute uh, about 20% of the global uh, plastic production, mainly some uh, big, some country like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, uh, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, so you can see here that uh, more than 70% uh, of the global mid-managed plastic uh, is coming from Asia. Uh, this is, a, uh, you can see here that the data in uh, 2010, and uh, it, it, we continue with the visit and user, and by the year 2025, the, uh, the amount of uh, mismanaged plastic will continue to increase in the region. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is the, the takeaway food culture, e-commerce activity, and such as uh, economies are growing uh, very rapidly in, in our region and lead to the increased use of plastic products. In addition, the consumer preference are also shipping from traditional fresh food to packaged food. At the same time, we are now start to increase shopping 
on the digital platform. So uh, consequently, uh, this convenience has resulted in increasing a lot uh, in the plastic waste, uh, with uh, mismanaged plastic waste emerging as an environmental problem in the region. This is a, an example from the uh, from Philippines. Our colleagues has worked very hard to show very uh, very uh, good uh, overview pictures about the plastic flow in in the Philippines. Uh, so you can see here that uh, Philippines has been identified as a one of the uh, seven largest contributor of the mismanaged plastic waste uh, to the coastal environment globally. And it's estimated that about one, more than 1 million tons of plastic waste uh, were calculated as mismanaged uh, by the year in, in 2016. So as you can see here that about 35% uh, of them are leakage to the environment and uh, 30, 33 uh, are deposited mainly in the landfill and so on. And very small percent has been recycled and mostly the uh, high quality plastic like pet bottle and so on. So uh, the 35% the of the plastic leakage to environment either enter the uh, waterways or uh, retain uh, in, on the land. This is another example of the plastic composition in the municipal solid waste in ASEAN country. And you can see here that this example in Thailand, uh, when they do the beach cleanup activities uh, in 2017, and they found that uh, a plastic bag uh, is, uh, is, a, is a dominant uh, a plastic item found along the beach. And uh, similarly, uh, a, a wet characteristics uh, in Vietnam also show that uh, a plastic bag uh, account for a major part uh, of, of plastic waste in the municipal solid waste here. Yeah. So um, most of the plastic we uh, use nowadays is uh, a single-use uh, plastic item. So it means that it's very have a very short uh, life, uh, but but it 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 takes a, a hundred years for the mother nature to decompose those uh, plastic item. This just give you an example. For example, the plastic bag that we often use uh, nowadays uh, it 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 took more than twenty years for 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 uh, to de decompose. So similarly, some other items like water bottle, uh, uh, plastic toothbrush, and so on, it takes even 500 years to decompose. So um, that is an issue. And in order to, um, to understand about, more about the plastic, uh, um, scientists has already classified the plastic by uh, size, by shape, and by, by color. As Dr. Uh, Trady already mentioned, there's uh, plastic with the size from one to one micrometer to five millimeter is considered as a microplastic. And uh, it's also um, the, the, uh, classified by the shape. So you can see here that the microplastic can be in the shape of a fragment. Normally fragment is, it, is the original from the uh, broken down of the macroplastic or in the form of fiber, bead, uh, firm or pellet. It also classified by color. Uh, the color is very important for us to track the, the, the parents' original of the, my, uh, of the plastic product. Uh, the plastic microplastic can also be classified by the polymer tie and uh, uh, classified by their toxicity. And you can see here that we can divide in several uh, uh, common uh, type of polymer like uh, PET and HDP, HDP, uh, HDPE and so on. And it depends on the type of the polymer. So it may, uh, it may take uh, five to 10 years or 100 years uh, for, for, for the mother nature to, de to decompose this uh, plastic. So um, next, I'd like to focus more on the, uh, on the river uh, um, plastic. Why we focus on the river? Uh, you know that uh, about 80% of the marine plastic uh, litter uh, from the land-based salt it uh, through the different pathway and river is considered one of the major pathway for land-based uh, plastic waste and mostly uh, coming from the uh, single plastic item. And it's estimated that about 1.1 to 2.4 million tons of plastic debris has been uh, discharged to the, uh, from the global river into the ocean every year. And it is 6% of them are coming from uh, Asian country. And unfortunately, it's estimated that uh, four ASEAN country and China contribute about half of the world marine plastic litter generation. So um, 
as Dr. Strati also mentioned that um, uh, there's very few study uh, on the microplastic in, in Asia, also uh, in ASEAN region. And so this, this study, uh, there's one study uh, conducted in 2019, they show that uh, a, a growing interest on the microplastic has been, um, has been observed, uh, but mostly as uh, you see here that uh, most of the public paper on, on the microplastic is from European country. So account for about 60%, uh, 67%. Uh, um, so uh, that's why uh, we are, there's lack of information on the, on the status of the of microplastic uh, pollution in, in the ASEAN region. So as uh, Dr. Sardi also mentioned that the, the microplastic can come in from uh, different sorts. It's coming from the household, like the washing machine, or, or, or it's coming from the personal care products, or from the surface uh, water runoff, like Thai city dust, road making, and so on. It can also come in from the mismanaged uh, plastic waste. Uh, so we divide into the uh, primary or secondary uh, microplastic. And, uh, Ultimately, most of this microplastic is end up in the sewage and drainage system. And in most of the case in ASEAN country where the wastewater treatment system is not available or only small percent of the wastewater has been treated in the wastewater treatment plant. So as a result, most of microplastic from this sort is going directly uh, to the river before uh, moving to the ocean. So it's caused a lot of problem, uh, not only to the ecosystem, but also to the uh, human health. So uh, you can see this figure a little bit small, but I, I just want to show you that a growing number of research uh, to show the occurrence of microplastic, not only in the fresh water, not only in the soil, not only in the wastewater, but also in the marine biota and other. This is another example from, uh, from, our, uh, uh, from the work of our college in, in the Philippines, uh, showing the, uh, the, micro, uh, the, uh, the microplastic occurrence in some major river basin as well as in the creeks in the Philippines. So they uh, divide, they characterize uh, different uh, kind of microplastic by shape, by size, by color, and by polymer type. And so according to um, uh, the study, it said that um, the abundance of microplastic is ranging from 1.3 uh, particle per cubic meter. Uh, it can be up to uh, nearly 60,000 uh, particle per cubic meter in the river. And you can see here, the, the figure uh, uh, here is say that the, you can see that the dominant occurrence of the fragment and PP, uh, PP plastic uh, may originate uh, from, the, from the degrade of a breakdown of the macro plastic. So it, it can clearly see that due to the poor measurement of the solid weight of the uh, macro plastic, so it's called a lot of problem. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, microplastic uh, pollution in the river as well. This is another study uh, done by uh, our colleague, um, Dr. Strati uh, in, in, in Vietnam. So uh, she uh, conducted a study in uh, 21 uh, environment in Vietnam, including the, in the river, lakes, uh, bay, and beach in SCD and province in Vietnam. And the results show that the microplastic concentration in the surface water is vary from 0.35 to more than uh, 2,500 items per cubic meter. Uh, and, um, and the fiber, you can see the figure here, the fiber is the dominate, uh, dominate uh, over the fragment in most of the environment. Uh, and, and what does it mean? It means that this river it mostly receives uh, a, a wastewater from the household uh, because normally uh, the, uh, the, the, the fragment, uh, uh, the fragment, uh, I mean, the, the fiber is uh, coming from, uh, from, from watching machine. So uh, what could be the potential impact of microplastic pollution um, on, on, on the food chain as well as on, on, on human health? Uh, as uh, all, uh, at the previous uh, presentation mentioned that uh, the microplastic can be ingested by the plankton at the bottom of the uh, aquatic food chain. And then later on, it will be ingested by small fish and larger fish uh, before moving to the next level and e even, even, to the, even enter the human body. So some study has carried out recently in Indonesia uh, has already found that uh, uh, 76 fish sample across different uh, species were collected from a market in Indonesia. And it's so that uh, the, the microplastic has been found in, in those fish 
in all 55 species. And in another study carried out in Japan also saw that the, the microplastic were detected in the digestive tract of 49 out of 64 Japanese anchovies sampled in the Tokyo Bay. Okay, um, so uh, again, uh, at the moment, there's very few study on the, on the, the impact of microplastic on the human health. However, the indirect impact it may cause because the microplastic, it can contain some kind of toxic uh, contaminant. And also, for example, like, like heavy methane or, or, or some antibiotic resistant bacteria and so on. Uh, and, do, uh, and then it can act as a, as a carrier. So ingestion of this uh, toxic chemical can cause a lot of problem to the human uh, and, and it's even cause some, some cancer. So this is a very shocking uh, photo uh, taken in, uh, in, in the waste so much uh, found in the Philippines and it, it shows that uh, it contains about 88 pounds uh, of track and mostly is, you can see here that is a, a plastic bag. Also, a lot of report has uh, shown on the occurrence of microplastic uh, in, in the seafood in, in the Southeast Asia. You can see here that uh, example from Philipp uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, and even Singapore as well. So in terms of the uh, microplastic, it can enter the human body through different uh, ways, uh, maybe through the direct contact with the plastic, microplastic, or uh, through the injection through, through the food chain and so on. So it caused a lot of problem, uh, health problem, and even it can, uh, uh, it can call, uh, how can how I say, uh, not only the, the chronics, but the, the, the serious, but also long-term uh, health issue. And most recently, a, a study has been carried out uh, in, in, uh, in public this year show that the presence of microplastic in the human placent, uh, placenta. And, 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 and it's, it's really uh, shocking. And then this microplastic uh, 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 report uh, uh, that possibly you for the man-made uh, coating, uh, pain, and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, all of this I mentioned in early slide that all of uh, plastic will end up in the sewage system and uh, it can be treated in the wastewater treatment plan. So it depends on the effectiveness of the wastewater treatment plan. Uh, the ratio of the, of the microplastic can be removed either high or low. So this figure show you one of the ongoing study, uh, ongoing work carried out by our partner in the Philippines. Say, uh, see that the, the removal efficiency of microplastic can be variety, depend on the uh, performance of, 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 of the wastewater treatment uh, units or process. Similarly, similarly, also in the water treatment plan, yeah. So in order to address the plastic, uh, microplastic issue, it's not just uh, uh, during the consumption uh, phase, but also we have to consider all the process ac across the plastic value chains, including the design, production, distribution, and, and, and so on. And uh, I just has worked very uh, actively uh, in the region in the last uh, few years, and also we understand that there's a necessary to develop a both not only short term, but also medium and long term to address the issue. And it's always said that the prevention is always better than uh, clean up. Uh, and then we can uh, promote this kind of prevention through different way uh, method like awareness raising, behavior chain and structure. And also that's also important to have a kind of innovative business model for the plastic uh, recycling uh, with involvement of the private sector. Uh, at the regional level, uh, the ASEAN uh, country also have uh, developed, uh, also issued ASEAN framework uh, of actions on marine debris, and also recently uh, ASEAN regional action plan for combating the marine plastic, which also highlight the necessity to address the microplastic issue. Uh, at the national level, many countries also make a great effort to address this challenge, uh, like for example, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and so on by develop a kind of a roadmap or national action plan to address the plastic waste issue and uh, especially highlight on the need to stop the single uh, use of plastic. And so this is a very uh, few uh, key messages from our works uh, now. And first it's important for ASEAN country to install and optimize the performance of the wastewater treatment facility. In addition to that, we can also consider to strictly control the discharge of wastewater containing microplastic into the aquatic environment 
through um, uh, develop a kind of national quality standard uh, related to the microplastic pollutant, not only uh, for drinking water, but also for the effluent discharge. In addition to that, we can also, uh, it's also important to properly manage the plastic waste in order to avoid the leakage uh, to the environment and also reduce the use of a uh, single uh, plastic uh, product. So this is the uh, very few uh, recommendations uh, from our works. Uh, I, I hope you, um, uh, you learn uh, uh, something useful for, from our, our, our presentation. And if you have any further question, we are very free, uh, very happy to, to answer uh, your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pham, for presenting the current state of the knowledge in the region. Uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Sembling. Uh, she will present the current state of research in Indonesia. She attends the session. Uh, however, to avoid the possible internet problems, we would like to show her present recorded presentation. Good afternoon, konnichiwa. We are going to discuss the current state of riverine microplastic in Indonesia. I am Amanda Sembiring, a faculty member of Civil and Environmental Engineering Institute Technology Bandung. The report is presented at International Forum for Sustainable Asia and the Pacific ISAF 2021. The plastic production has been increased since 1950, and since 2012, the global production of waste had reached 3.4 million tons per day. Half of it was not degradable, and this figure is expected to double by 2025. The mismanage of plastic waste has caused possible spread of plastic in the environment and eventually lead to the fragmentation of this substance into smaller particles, turning it into microplastics. Microplastic are plastic with size less than five millimeter. Based on its origin, microplastic can be divided into two categories. Primer, primary microplastic, which primarily produced at the manufacturer in micro size, and the secondary microplastic, which a fragmented large plastic into small pieces less than five millimeter. The objective of this report is to develop review and develop baseline information for an evidence-based policy. We opt for liter literature review method to summarize the state of microplastic in riverine environment in Indonesia. The search based on systematic review process. All available data in Scopus databases or gray literature, such as government report proceedings, student final report, thesis, or dissertations can be considered as the source of information. If we compare with the neighboring countries in Southeast Asia, the plastic consumption in Indonesia is less. However, we, the need of plastic production is increased over time. If we consume more, it is more likely that we waste more. Bear in mind that waste is a consequence of everyday life. If you don't manage it, it gets dumped. We don't consume materials. We merely use them and ultimately return them often in altered state to the environment. In Indonesia, most of plastic used for food and beverage packaging. Remember, the more plastic leakage to the environment, the more possible microplastic we found in the environment. According to studies, number of plastic leakage in Indonesia range from 200,000 to 700,000 ton per year. There are several sources of microplastic in the environment, such as fragmentation of micro macroplastic from urban activities and human activities, wastewater treatment plant, solid waste facilities, and etc. Based on the systematic review, only 30% of literatures discuss about the microplastic in riverine environment, and none has discussed the prevalence of microplastic in relation to wastewater treatment plant. 
Here are several studies of microplastic in Indonesia. It shows that the unit and protocol of reporting the studies varies. The occurrence of microplastic in riverine environments range from 0.05 to 11,000 particles per cubic meters. It shows the result varies in order of six. More Morphology study shows that the size, color, and type varies among locations. However, we found that more polyethylene and polypropylene found in the environment. In conclusion, prevalence of microplastic in riverine environment in Indonesia has been proved based on the scientific findings. Gaps of microplastic prevalence knowledge on source is huge in Indonesia. The systematic review also found that there is no literature which included in screening literature process relates to microplastic in wastewater treatment plant. As wastewater treatment plant is also a source of microplastic, the future direction of microplastic investigations should also include study of microplastic in wastewater treatment plant. Based on the current knowledge, the type and color of microplastic varies in several locations in Indonesia. The polymer type mostly found in the riverine environment are polyethylene and polypropylene. Thank you. Arigato gojaimasu. Thank you, Dr. Simbring, for sharing the situation and the state of research in Indonesia. I now would like to invite our final speaker, Dr. La. Um, due to time difference between Tokyo and Michigan, he is not here with us today. Uh, he prepared his presentation in advance. If you have questions to Dr. Laf, uh, please send it to us via the Q&A box. We will send it to him after the session. Please do not forget to write your email address to receive his response. Hello. My name is Chris Ruff. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, USA. And I'd like to thank you for inviting me to present uh, some of our work on detection and imaging of microplastics from space at the ISAP 2021 session on riverine microplastics pollution in Asian countries. Um, as an overview of the presentation today, I'll be discussing some uh, recent satellite radar observations we've made of ocean surface roughness anomalies. And we found that those anomalies are highly correlated with uh, spatial distributions of ocean microplastic concentrations. Um, we've used that correlation to develop uh, time-lapse imagery of the plastic concentration and are able to show some um, interesting um, plastic concentration dynamics globally and regionally. Um, I should um, point out that the correlation that we find between the roughness anomaly and the microplastic concentration is empirical, and it uh, may be an indirect correlation, not a direct relationship between the microplastics themselves and the roughness, but rather with something else correlated with microplastics. And we suspect that what may be happening is that the suppression of roughness that creates the roughness anomaly is being introduced by surfactants on the ocean surface, which have similar transport mechanisms as the microplastics do, and hence um, can act as tracers for the presence of the microplastics. Um, I'll briefly mention some laboratory experiments that are ongoing now to address this question of what is the direct physical relationship between the observed roughness anomaly and the surface conditions. And we've been um, introducing controlled amounts of microplastics and surfactants into a uh, wave tank um, environment and then assessing the impact on roughening and roughness suppression. And then finally, I'll discuss, discuss briefly the possibility of using this method not just over open ocean surfaces, which is what we've done so far, but extending them to applications in uh, river environments. And it looks like that may be possible, and I'll show you why towards the end of the talk. Uh, so uh, briefly, the, um, the satellite um, 
system that we've been working with to date um, is the NASA Cyclone Global Navigation Satellite System, or Cygnus. Um, it was launched in December 2016. Um, it's a constellation of eight microsatellites in a low inclination orbit um, between 38 degrees north and south latitude, which is um, the, the range over which we're able to make our measurements. Um, each satellite carries a bi-static radar system, which measures both the direct signal from GPS navigation satellites to our satellites, and also from a GPS to the surface, scattering back into the ocean, and then we measure the scattered signal when it um, goes back up into space. Um, from those measurements, we're able to measure the scattering cross-section of the surface of the Earth, and that's the fundamental engineering measurement that's made. Um, the scattering cross-section can be converted into a measure of the roughness of the surface, which we characterize using a statistical measure of roughness known as the mean square slope. Um, it has a very straightforward relationship, an inverse relationship, um, to the measured scattering cross-section. Uh, the proportionality constant is the Fresnel power reflection coefficient. So by measuring sigma naught, we're able to estimate surface roughness, or MSS. Um, what we then do is take those MSS measurements and compare them to estimates of what the MSS should be um, using a scattering model forced by um, reanalysis wind speeds from a, uh, a reanalysis model. We've tried it with GDAS, Mira 2, Era 5, a number of different um, wind speed models, and the results are very similar in each case. So we take the um, reanalysis winds, calculate what the MSS should be um, in um, clear water conditions, and then we compare them to our measurements. And the difference between those is what we call the MSS anomaly. So it's how much less rough the ocean surface actually is than it uh, should be given the model forced by the local winds. Um, this technique is described in detail in a paper uh, referenced here by, uh, by um, um, Madeline Evans and myself. Uh, here's uh, some imagery of the results. The top image is an annual average of the MSS anomaly measured by the uh, Cygnus uh, spaceborne radars. And then below it is uh, the output of a um, ocean microplastic concentration model developed by Van Sibyl et al. And um, you can see that they have generally similar features when the uh, uh, microplastic concentration is high, the MSS anomaly tends to be strong negative, meaning there's more suppression of roughening, and when the uh, water is clear, the concentration is low for microplastics, the um, MSS anomaly tends to be close to zero, meaning that the uh, ocean roughening is um, consistent with the model. Um, so we take this um, relationship between MSS anomaly and ocean microplastic as an empirical relationship with which we derive an empirical retrieval algorithm. So we measure MSS anomaly, estimate microplastic concentration, and then from that we can then generate time-lapse imagery of the derived microplastic concentration um, using time-lapse measurements um, by the spaceborne radars. Um, so here's uh, an example of the microplastic concentration retrieved in this way from the satellite. That's the bottom panel. Uh, the top panel is an aggregate of all net trawl in situ measurements of ocean microplastic concentration. Um, this is an aggregate over a very long period of time, 1972 to 2015. So it's not a snapshot of the ocean concentration because certainly the concentration has been changing over time, probably getting, getting higher or worse. Um, but you can clearly see in the top image the uh, higher concentration in the North Pacific, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and in the bottom panel you can see that same region again highlighted in that red box um, showing higher concentrations in that part of the ocean and then uh, lower concentrations um, near the um, equator. Um, you can also see in the bottom panel that there's high concentrations in um, other ocean basins, in other gyres, the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and South Pacific. So this bottom image is, a, um, as I said, an annual average, but we're able to take this algorithm and um, do it in smaller periods of time to, to create uh, time-lapse imagery of the concentration, and this next panel will show that. 
So this is a time-lapse image over one year of the microplastic concentration, and there's a couple things that are noteworthy. Um, in the northern hemisphere, you see higher concentrations in the summer, and uh, now the time is passing into winter, and the concentration drops in the northern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere, in particular the South Atlantic and South Pacific, the concentration is higher in the local, um, in the local summer there. And then um, when you come back around to summer in the northern hemisphere, the concentration again starts to increase in the northern hemisphere. Um, we suspect that what's happening here, um, in, although this is just a hypothesis, we suspect that what's happening is in general in uh, local winter in both the northern and southern hemisphere, there's um, quite a bit more uh, vertical mixing of the surface layers of water, and the vertical mixing would tend to dilute the concentration at the surface. We think that's um, possibly what's happening. Um, so to get a, a more quantitative look at the seasonal variations in these concentrations in both the northern and southern hemisphere, we've broken up the, uh, the, the regions of the uh, ocean basins into four, four parts. Um, one of them is the North Atlantic, another is the North Pacific, another is the South Atlantic, and another is the South Pacific. Um, so we've taken just the North Atlantic um, quadrant and averaged the data across, the, uh, um, um, across all longitudes in the North Pacific Basin and then looked at a time series variations of just the North Pacific over and that's the uh, plot on the left. Uh, the North Pacific over time you can see is quite a bit higher in the summer months and then decreases in the winter months. And then we've done the same in the South Pacific and you can see that it's higher in the uh, summer months of the South uh, Southern Hemisphere. And then the global average um, of plastic concentration has very little seasonal variability. Uh, we've also taken that large database of net trawl data from 1972 to 2015 and broken the data up by month and um, just averaged all the different measurements made within each month, um, and that's plotted on the right. And you can see here also what looks like, um, or sorry, we, I, I should say, we, we've taken the data and just isolated the parts of the net trawl data in the North Pacific uh, on the right. So in the North Pacific, you can see higher concentrations in the summer, lower concentrations in the winter, although uh, you know, there's several qualifiers that must be pointed out in the uh, net trawl data on the right. Uh, one is that um, there's a huge variation in time here, and um, this is not a stationary process, so the concentrations are probably increasing over time. And so measurements made in any particular month um, are spanning several decades. Um, that's one caveat. And the other is that there's a, a lot more measurements made in the northern hemisphere than the southern, southern hemisphere, so it's a little bit difficult to tell from this whether there truly is a seasonal signal. I think what would be very advantageous uh, for a validation study of um, our um, results from the satellite observations would be if there could be a sustained um, in situ measurement in uh, one particular um, ocean gyre, like the North Pacific, um, um, monthly over an entire year to see if this um, seasonal variation uh, is borne out by in situ measurements. Um, next, we uh, took the same uh, satellite observations and zoomed in on some regional areas. We um, focused on the uh, outflow from major rivers around the world, and this is an example of one, um, the Yangtze. Uh, we chose this because it's been um, postulated or suggested that it um, has the highest um, annual outflow of plastic debris into the ocean. And in fact, when we looked at uh, many different major river outflows, it, it does seem to be the, the strongest um, outflow um, flux uh, compared to the other rivers. And these four images um, give you an example of that. Um, the top left one, um, panel A, is an annual average over a full year of the uh, microplastic concentration in the East China Sea, and you can see that it's uh, fairly benign. But then we went through and looked one week at a time through the full year, and we isolated the three weeks when we saw the strongest um, evidence of outflow, and those are shown in the other three panels, B, C, and D. And you can see what looks like um, significant microplastic outflow um, from the, uh, the mouth of the Yangtze and Kiangtang rivers. Um, very briefly, uh, the wave tank experiment that's ongoing now, this is a picture of the wave tank. This is um, here at the University of Michigan. Um, the wave tank has controlled 
um, wave generation both by a mechanical plunger and also by uh, large controlled laminar flow fans with variable uh, wind speed um, from which we get surface roughening. And then along the length of the wave tank there are ultrasonic uh, sensors uh, labeled here sensor 1 through 6 which measure the uh, surface uh, roughness properties and from that we can derive the uh, mean square slope and the equivalent uh, scattering cross-section uh, had there been a radar making the measurements. Um, this is just one uh, example, a control experiment when the water was clean and you can see the surface is roughened by, um, by the wind flow and then an example of the roughness spectrum measured by the ultrasonic sounder is shown on the right and from this we can, we can integrate, the, um, it's basically the second moment of this spectrum here gives us the mean square slope. And uh, so um, what we've done um, in the last few months is made many, many measurements with this wave tank um, uh, in this configuration while adding controlled concentrations of surfactants and controlled uh, number densities and size uh, distributions of microplastics. And what we've seen is um, a suppression of the roughening of the surface um, that's um, related to the presence of the uh, you know, surfactants and microplastics and also related to the concentrations or number densities in a manner um, that's generally consistent with the measurements made by, by the satellite system. So um, that's very encouraging that we're kind of getting a, a handle on the physical processes that, that are involved. And I'll just um, say that uh, we're just finishing up um, writing up the results of this experiment now, and we expect to have a, a manuscript ready for submission uh, to peer review within the next few weeks. Um, finally, a, a few comments about whether um, we'll be, um, we might be able to use this same technique over inland waterways, in particular over rivers. Um, so when Cygnus makes measurements um, over the open ocean, the scattering is typically uh, incoherent. This is an electromagnetic scattering property. is incoherent uh, because of the roughness properties of the ocean, and that results in a spatial resolution of 15 to 25 kilometers. Uh, it varies depending on the incidence angle of the observation. However, over inland waterways, we found that the, uh, the surface tends to be quite a bit smoother, especially the long wave swell is suppressed over rivers and lakes, and because of that, the electromagnetic scattering transitions from incoherent to coherent, and when that happens, the resolution gets quite a bit better, several orders of magnitude better, um, and varies between about 300 and 1,000 meters, depending, again, on incidence angle. Um, this is an example of measurements made by Cygnus um, over South America, and you can see um, quite high resolution of inland tributaries and rivers. And um, as an example of sort of the contrast between spatial resolutions in incoherent and coherent conditions, um, this is a picture of um, a section of the river that's blocked off by that black square. Um, if the resolution were um, degraded to 30 kilometers, which is sort of the upper bound of the um, incoherent scattering conditions, um, and compare that to the actual measurements made by Cygnus over this section, and you can see that the spatial resolution is much, much better, um, of order hundreds of meters. So that, um, um, you know, suggests that it may be possible to resolve uh, these inland waterways. So we have the spatial resolution for these rivers. The question then becomes, are we sensitive enough to the roughness conditions on the surface, and in particular the suppression of roughening because of the presence of either microplastics or surfactants? And to get that, there was a recent uh, study done and a publication that just came out a few months ago um, looking at uh, wind roughening of lake surfaces when you have, uh, with the Cygnus um, satellite again, when you have high spatial resolution and um, what, what was found is that um, even though the surface gets a little bit rough when the wind blows, it's still smooth enough, especially the long waves um, scale sizes, it's smooth enough to support um, coherent res um, scattering, which means that the spatial resolution is still very high, um, and yet you can sense the uh, sensitivity of the reflected signal to roughening. And this is a, uh, a few pictures from this uh, paper by Loria et al. Um, on the left is a picture of the river, uh, Lake um, uh, Lopango in El Salvador, and on the right are derived significant wave height measurements from the Cygnus data, um, and the information content in the significant wave height um, estimate is based on the roughening of the surface. So this shows that there is a sensitivity to surface roughness and yet there's still very high spatial resolution. And those are the, those are the two components that are needed in order to accurately estimate the, um, um, the uh, um, mean square slope anomaly and then from that the uh, microplastic concentration. So I think it is possible. 
All right, in summary, um, Cygnus has shown that we have, uh, are able to make satellite observations of roughness anomalies, and those anomalies are highly correlated with uh, ocean microplastic concentrations. Um, once we use that uh, or leverage that uh, correlation, we're able to generate um, time-lapse images of the concentrations, and we found major seasonal variations or fluctuations in the concentrations in both um, Pacific and Atlantic basins. Uh, we've also seen episodic outflow from major rivers and uh, into the ocean. And uh, finally, a preliminary look at the sensitivities and spatial resolutions involved over rivers suggests that it may be possible to extend this, um, this technique to rivers. Uh, what we're doing next is um, uh, there's a ocean microplastic data product that will be uh, released by the NASA PODAC this fall, um, probably later this month. So everyone will be able to work with the data that we've produced so far. Um, we're continuing with the wave tank experiments to confirm and characterize the physical relationship between the roughness suppression and what the radar measures. And we're also looking at extending this technique to other satellite radars because there's many others. And we've found so far that this uh, same basic approach will work with um, other satellites as well. So that's very promising. Thank you very much, all speakers, for sharing very informative and excellent presentations with us. Um, the research project on um, microplastics would provide important input for us and policymakers to tackle the problems. Since we have limited time today, uh, we will have Q&A after the session, if time allows. Um, so now uh, we want to move on to the panel discussion. Uh, today we invited uh, Ms. Salem, Dr. Abenayaka, and Mr. Wiganda. Um, thank you for joining the panel discussion today. Um, you are all from different sectors, uh, academic, business, and international organizations. So based on your expertise, uh, we would like to ask you how to solve the current situation in the ASEAN region. So what would be the direction towards solving this microplastic issue in this region? How could each sector contribute to this solution? And please provide your opinions in three minutes. You can use slide uh, to explain if you prefer. Uh, uh, let's start from Ms. Uh, Salem from UNSCAP. Uh, what would be the direction to solve the issue? Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk from the perspective of uh, managing this issue from a macro plastics point of view and looking at how that can um, uh, perhaps translate into micro plastics. So if you um, allow me to just share my screen briefly, um, I will um, hopefully get the right screen. Um, so let me know if that's the right one. Okay, so in the Closing the Loop project, we see that this is a three-step um, project that when it comes to the plastic pollution into aquatic environments, first you need to measure uh, the current status of the plastic pollution, you need to introduce a monitoring system, and then you need to introduce a, a management system. Um, so I'll talk about some of the work that we've done with the macroplastics, um, the first one, which we've done um, together with IGES um, in four cities in Southeast Asia, is a baseline assessment that tried to provide that quantitative information about what is the source of plastic pollution, which products are generating that plastic pollution and where those leakage points are, and then match that quantitative information with qualitative information about the stakeholders, the policies and the institutional environments. Um, now, what we need is a, a twin of this process for microplastics. With macroplastics, uh, we, we develop, we use a model called the Plastic Pollution Calculator um, that identifies how much plastic waste is generated from which activities, how much goes into waste, um, how much is dumped, uh, escapes the waste, um, and then how much uh, goes into the waterways. And each of these boxes is a data set. Um, 
and using a model um, that is accepted globally as well um, is quite helpful. It gives us nice summarized information. Like what we found in Denang is that 1.3% of the plastic waste ends up as aquatic debris um, and another 6.8 is retained on land. Um, then we also found that uh, which products were dominating the plastic pollution, and that's the plastic bags. Um, and a lot of these are precursors to microplastics. Um, so, so I think it is helpful to see what, what's happening with the macroplastics first. Um, but of course, it won't capture things like microplastics from AstroTurf or from um, wastewater. Um, the second thing that we are doing, which is similar to what Chris uh, Dr. Roof um, presented is we want to introduce more automated monitoring systems and that can help those governments or other stakeholders keep an eye on it. Um, so for us, we're looking at looking at the macro um, plastics. Um, we use this system and so it's um, a set of remote sensors. So I could imagine with microplastics, we could adapt um, something like filters or something in water um, with sensors attached. We use satellites, citizen sites and uh, vehicles, uh, cameras on vehicles. They're there, our eyes on the ground. Um, and then we use um, artificial intelligence and a GIS data sharing systems to kind of put all that information together in a way that we can integrate it. Um, and then what we really want to do is show the hotspots of where that plastic pollution is. Is it getting more is it getting less or is it moving and that helps those the, the those managing the action plan which is the the final step it helps them understand um are those priorities that they had identified and the actions that they had identified to achieve um, policy goals around plastic pollution are they working um, is it really leading to a reduction in plastic pollution um, and so we've worked with um, those four cities to develop the the city action plans um, and that baseline assessment in that first step is a very um, important precursor to these action plans so that you have the right evidence base um, um, to support your assumptions about what is actually causing that that plastic waste. Um, I do want to also mention we have an e-learning um, program that I just has contributed so that people can learn about it. Um, but that's what that's what I would say about the microplastics from our perspective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Salem, uh, for sharing how you are working uh, to address the issue with partners. And um, now I would like to ask the same question to Dr. Abenayaka. How could the academia contribute to solve this problem? You, you as a researcher. Thank you so much, uh, Inamura san So, yeah, I think. Uh, uh, Dr. Emily, Dr. Pam, and uh, Dr. Amanda also provided a nice background to uh, start my point. So I, I will try to uh, some uh, focus on mainly two points. The one uh, uh, during this discussion, so the, uh, the session, so one main point raised was uh, the data. Uh, so if we're planning to uh, have a uh, the monitoring and evidence-based policy-making process. So we need uh, uh, the, to support the environmental sound management. So we need uh, data. So in this case, uh, I, I try to focus, I try to summarize uh, into three major points. So first one is, I think one point raised was uh, the quantity of data. Uh, the other one is the quality of data. So let's say uh, the ASEAN region, so need uh, the quantity we have to worry. Uh, and uh, but I think with the new projects and other research activities, so that quantity is uh, getting higher. Uh, the important point is we have to maintain the quality, so quality of the data. Uh, then uh, it means uh, we have to support with the standardization of uh, methods and uh, uh, the resources such as human resource, trained people, and the facilities. Uh, then uh, the other another important point, so maybe many uh, people uh, uh, forgetting, is uh, the diversity of data. So, so we have to focus on the diversity of data as well in microplastic. For example, uh, is it uh, whether we have enough data on river or which kind of river? So, and also the the biota, the sediment and wastewater, and the soil and uh, like other wastewater treatment plants such. 
So that that's another key point. So the three points: the quality of uh, quantity of data, quality of data, and the diversity of data. And uh, th this uh, has to uh, consider by the funding organizations and project planners and the other uh, organizations working on the area. Like if if we uh, currently if we thought like if somebody is very good with doing measuring microplastic in certain environment, so and he can publish many uh, reports or uh, publications. So the funding should not be channeled to only focusing on that kind of thing. So we have to think about how to diversify the data. Uh, then my, I will come to the next point, the collaboration between academia, uh, the uh, government and private sector. Uh, so for that, I will uh, try to explain using a small slide. Uh, which I was experienced during my uh, previous assignment. So let me share my screen. I hope uh, you can see my screen. Uh, yes, yeah, so here, so, yeah. so here what I want to uh, mention is uh, uh, the, the case of artificial turf, uh, the broken artificial turf leakage. Uh, in this case, uh, 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 the, what, for the first thing we did was the, uh, data gathering, so scientific evidence, microplastic sampling. Then after sampling, uh, we have to focus on the analysis and uh, uh, the data processing. So when we found uh, that there was such some kind of microplastic green color, so then uh, we have to find out the source. So from where it comes, then we uh, focus, uh, collaborate, like discuss with the industries and potential sources. Then finally identified, so these microplastics come from the artificial turf. So then uh, uh, we disclose the data. So, so once we disclose the data through media and uh, through other channels, so we can gather the stakeholders uh, who are responsible and who are willing to uh, help on tackling this issue. So then uh, the fourth step comes, so the communication become very easy. Uh, so after uh, we have evidence, scientifically proven evidence, then uh, uh, collect the stakeholders, so then develop the solution. So these five steps, so once we follow these five steps, so it is very easy uh, to take action. So at the end, uh, the uh, government, like city officers, the city office, and the producers, the who manufactures the artificial turf, and who is constructing the ground. So we need the environmental sound management to uh, uh, tackle this issue. For that, we need uh, that kind of stakeholders and the recycling industry and uh, the public awareness are, are very important. So that, that was uh, one uh, classic example I like to share as a solution to tackle this. So this is a, this model is suitable even for uh, anywhere in the world. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Avinayaka for showing a, a direction of, um, academic uh, sector and uh, how to collaborate with other sectors. Um, and um, now I would like to ask the same question to Mr. Wiganda from uh, a person from the business sector. Uh, how could your sector contribute to solve the issue? You, you have three minutes to explain. Yeah. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it was a pleasure to be invited in this event. Um, yes, my name is Justin Wiganda. I'm from Indonesia Plastic Recycling Association. Um, honestly, I do not have the expertise to talk about microplastics. However, um, personally, I believe there are, there are microplastics in our ocean or in our river at some level. Um, about plastic recycling in regards to this event. Uh, I hope by doing a higher recycling rates will therefore reduce the chance of having a microplastics in our river or in our oceans. Um, the biggest issue I think in Indonesia or majority uh, the rest of the world it's a waste management issue, whereas the collection and segregation is the main problem. And also uh, human behavior, it's a major factor. 
Uh, lack of this, uh, with no doubt, it's a contributing factors to, to the topic of marine debris. And as I said, uh, very possibly microplastic in the, in the ocean or in the river. Um, plastic are made as a replacement materials, which are, it's so good that um, majority of all products are made of plastic nowadays. Um, plastic are designed as a non-degradable materials, actually, uh, the same as uh, glass or metals. Um, well, it, there's some technologies now that can make plastics become a degradable plastics, uh, which from recycling point of view, uh, it will create a confusion or a false hope at the customer level. By believing that the plastic will degrade at some level, the plastic user will unconsciously will think it's okay, it will degrade by itself. So it's all right to, to throw our plastic bags or bottles or whatever it is as the way we to throw things away. So we, which is more important, the, the product or it's the human behavior? No matter how good is the product, if we throw things unwisely, it will create waste at any level. Maybe it's in the forest, maybe in the ocean or in the land. So it's not because of the product itself. It's our behavior. Um, therefore, um, I'm, we, I'm not saying that degradable plastic is a, a bad item, but Degradable plastic must have a differentiation or a labeling to distinguish itself over normal plastic. So it will have a dis, uh, indication how long it will degrade or over what period or what kind of environment uh, each uh, situation that required for the plastic to be able to degrade. Um, and also when uh, degradable plastic are not uh, labeled properly, it will contaminate the normal or uh, original plastics and in which will affect uh, the quality of uh, the existing recycled uh, plastics. Uh, also, please bear in mind, um, all plastic waste are not the same as a raw material for recycling industries. As a recyclers, we can, we can only recycle based on the collected materials. Therefore, by increasing the collection rate, we'll undoubtedly will also increase recycling rates. Okay. Again, okay. collection and segregation, mm -hmm. supply and demand is a very essential factors for the recycling industry. Of course, there are some materials are more favorable compared to the others. Uh, for example, PET, it's a, it's a more sought after materials today. Everyone it's, wants to recycle PET. Um, so in some area, it seems like you're hunting in a zoo in, in some areas. Okay. Uh, there are also other plastics uh, which are not so desirable. Uh, such as like the sachet or the standing pouch or all these little, little packagings. Uh, no one wants to recycle them simply because it's hard to collect and also nobody wants to use it afterwards, okay. the, the recycled yes. materials. Yes, yes. Mr. Uh, we, gonna thank you very yes. much for sharing uh, very uh, as a um, consumer to use plastic and also as a uh, person to uh, promote recycling of plastic. Uh, thank you for sharing very, yes. very uh, important uh, insight and perspective. And uh, we would, would like to uh, continue listening to uh, your uh, expertise, uh, opinions, and um, also, uh, we want to continue the panel discussions, sure. but um, unfortunately, the time <laughs> to close yes. the session is coming. So um, um, very regrettable to say this, but uh, we have to close this session soon. All right, sure. So, but 
Yes, we learned a lot from um, academic uh, expert and also um, public sector, public sector, I mean, international organization uh, and also the business uh, person. So uh, thank you very much for sharing um, your insights and uh, providing us a lot of information. So to close the session, um, Dr. Pham will make a closing remark. Uh, Dr. Pham, please. Thank you, Dr. Inamura. Um, one again, on behalf of organizer IGS, I'd like to thank all the speaker, all the panelists and participants for your very active uh, contribution and very uh, share with us, very insightful thoughts how to address the, this uh, challenge of the microplastic from different viewpoints. So uh, from the session, we can clearly see that the river microplastic is an emerging and growing environmental problem, not only at the national level, but also at the regional and global level. So many uh, ASEAN countries are connected with each other by oceans and by river, especially the Mekong River. Therefore, we believe that this Chanbari uh, nature of the plastic litter issue, uh, due to this uh, nature of uh, uh, plastic, any single country solution will not be sufficient. Therefore, there's a strong need for the regional and collective efforts and strong commitment from all the ASEAN member states, as well as all relevant sectors. So we also learned from today's section that it's very crucial to address the various issues along the plastic value chain through the circular economy approach, even from the material attraction, design, productions, and consumption. And also all of these states are very essential to solve the problem. So one again, on behalf of the organizer, we would like to express our sincere thanks to all the speakers, panelists, as well as our participants for your very active and fruitful discussion today. We are very much looking forward to collaborating with all of you for jolly hand to address this issue in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much for joining. Um, I would like to thank all of you for joining this session. I hope the discussion was both fruitful and insightful. I sub, uh, 2021 is ongoing through the 3rd of December till tomorrow. I hope to see you in other sessions or at the next ISAP. Thank you. And uh, before we completely close the, this session, I'd like to ask you a favor of all of you in the audience. When this session concludes, you will be presented with a survey. Your feedback is very important for us to improve future session. So please take a moment to fill it out. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah.